On behalf of the family, welcome and thank you for gathering with us as we remember the life of Glenn Perry and together seek the comfort of God in the gospel. Members of Cornerstone, it's appropriate that having walked with Glenn in life, that we gather in this place to bid him farewell. We had covenanted to link arms with him on our journey to the celestial city, and now he has gone ahead before us. Carol Glenn Perry was born March 4th, 1951 in Hopskinville, Kentucky, and passed away June 5th, 2013. He graduated from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, summa cum laude. We all knew he was smart. And received his master's degree in business from Union University in Jackson, Tennessee. He was married to Barbara Perry of Jackson, Tennessee. He was preceded in death by his father, Carol Perry. He is survived by his mother, Catherine Perry of Goodlettsville, Tennessee, and four siblings, Trisha McConnell, Becky Pitt, Philip Perry, and Jenny Gentry. He's also survived by three children, Ralph Skip Collier, Trisha Lovelace, and Kim Lancaster, and 10 grandchildren, Lauren Lancaster, Rachel Lancaster, Cody Collier, Stephen Lancaster, Anna Beth Lancaster, Josh Sharp, Callie Collier, Daniel Lancaster, Renee Lancaster, and Carolyn Lancaster. As I've already mentioned, he was a member here at Cornerstone Community Church. We all have our different and varying memories, and some more will be said about that later. One of the main things that I think of with Glenn is him as a servant, typically behind the scenes. I think also about different times they're talking or joking about sports or different things but also really as an encourager. He went out of his way more than once to specifically encourage me in my labors. And because we loved and were loved, we hurt. Grief is real and we dare not deny it, but the gospel is real and we will live by it. We will live by it, meaning it will give us the strength, the courage to endure and to persevere. And we will live by it, meaning that the gospel leads us to resurrection, so that for all those in Christ, the ultimate end is life. But the rhythm of life will be grief and gospel. Gospel and grief. The gospel will ultimately undo all grief, but on this side, it will be gospel and grief, grief and gospel. And the scripture's clear that to grieve and to hurt is not evidence of lack of faith. It's the reality. But the scripture is also clear that in the midst of all this, God is our rock and he is our refuge. The Psalms particularly give us words even to express our grief, give us words to speak to God and to point us to our hope. So here are these words drawn from several different Psalms. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. But blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. With my voice, I cry out to the Lord. With my voice, I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. I cry to you, O Lord. 
I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. O Lord, all my longing is before you. My sighing is not hidden from you. My heart throbs. My strength fails me. And the light of my eyes, it has also gone from me. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer. For I am ready to fall, and my pain is ever before me. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you who made heaven and earth have made us your own and you have promised to uphold us. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the hope of the resurrection. And we thank you that you have told us that all those who know you, you have in your hand and no one and no thing can pluck them from your hand. And so, Lord, we ask that you would meet with us in this time. Have you, as you have met with us here before? And would you give comfort and strength to this dear family whom we love? And would you lift our hearts to the truths of your gospel, which uphold us, which are our hope, and in which Glenn rested? Speak, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
You may be seated. Glenn Perry was a dear brother and friend and encourager to me. I loved him. I know as his family and friends, you loved him and treasured him as well. And I know when you really love someone, you just, you want and you long and you pray and you hope that others out there will see in them what makes you love them so much and what makes you treasure them. So I just want you to know I saw it and I loved him. So I speak to you today as, as, as one who wants to comfort you, and yet I speak to you today as one who needs comfort with you. I stand here today as someone who's lost someone I've loved. I walked with Glenn Perry for literally half my life. About to be 35, I was a member of this church with Glenn Perry for 17 years. I've been his pastor for the last 14 years. It's no, it's no overstatement to say, humanly speaking, Glenn Perry is the reason that I'm here pastoring this group of people that I love so dearly. Now, if he could, he might chide me and challenge that statement because he liked to remind me consistently that he opposed me when they were voting. <laughs> but then he would quickly remind me, but I did that because I loved you. He would tell me, uh, you were young and I could foresee pain and heartache you were going to face and I wanted to spare you from it. I love him for that. But humanly speaking, he is why I'm here. Before I was pastor, when I was a member of the church, went through a time, as, as many churches do, when people were leaving. And I looked around and I thought, perhaps I should leave as well. And I remember sitting, I was going to point out the seat, but everything was oriented differently. But I was sitting over there facing that direction. And I looked over at Glenn and Barbara Perry, standing a couple rows up, and I said, Lord, I'm leaving when they leave. And Glenn Perry would not leave. <laughs> he just kept staying and being faithful and laboring with everything in him to hold together the people he loved so much. And then after I did become pastor, as Glenn rightly foresaw there were times of heartache and pain and he would comfort me and encourage me. If I thought there was someone against me, he would comfort me and defend them. And I trust that when he spoke to others, he would comfort them and defend me. And if you know Mr. Glenn, you know that that was just par for the course for him. He loved to serve and speak well of and build up those around him, and that is why I loved him so much. As Ray made reference, if you knew him well, you knew also he was a servant. He would try at times to lay that off as if it was Barbara. He told me one time, Lee, you need to tell Barbara that there's no law in the Bible that says you have to give away half of what you own. I could have responded and said, yeah, Mr. Glenn, just as there's no law that says when I call you for an electrical question, you have to show up at my front door to install my light for me. <laughs> or there's no law that says you have to open your home to dozens and dozens of people and provide them free housing. There's no law that says when the church needs to be fed at a church picnic, you have to prepare all the food for everyone. And yet he did. And he did because he loved and he preferred to do it without recognition. And there's so much more I could say. Time would fail me to tell of how he taught so many, how he would encourage you if you made the slightest attempt to serve him, how he wanted to make sure he didn't offend you in the least, was quick to be reconciled. If you went to rebuke him, he would receive your rebuke and thank you for loving him enough to rebuke him. He once asked the entire church for forgiveness because he didn't think he was doing enough to serve them. 
and how he loved the lavishing grace and encouragement on others and on and on. There's so many things in his life which show the evidence of God's transforming grace, things that testify to the faith that he professed in the finished work of Christ. But what I want to share with you this evening is a truth that I know Glenn Perry loved and loved deeply. It's also a truth that he struggled to believe, as I think we all do, because it's a truth that sounds too good to be true and yet is certainly true. The truth that Glenn Perry loved and like all of us struggled to believe is this. He loved the message that we're declared righteous before God and are approved of by God, not on the basis of any good works we've done or sins we've avoided, but by grace through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ alone. Now, I know he loved that truth because one day I was standing in the back of the church when a former member, a former pastor moved away, Jonathan Douglas was standing here and Jonathan walked up to me with Glenn standing at my side and Jonathan said, so what have you been preaching through recently? And at that time I had, was at the conclusion or getting near the conclusion of preaching through the book of Galatians. And uh, I told Jonathan, I've been preaching through Galatians and uh, he said, how's it going? I said, I, I think it's gone well. I think it's been a real help for the church. And Glenn jumped in, which he was rare to do. But he jumped in and he said, no, 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 no. What he's been saying these last several weeks, that's it. That's the real thing. That's what we need to say. This is what people need to hear. This is it. And what we said over and over and over as we walked through the book of Galatians as a church is really summed up in these two verses, Galatians 2, 15 and 16. Paul writes, we ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, it's hard to miss it. It feels like Paul says it about three times in those two verses. But the point is this. No one can be justified on the basis of any good works we've done. But there is a way to be justified. And it's through faith in Jesus Christ who lived and who died and who was raised for us. I want to unfold this truth for us tonight because I think this is our comfort. Over the past number of days and in the days going forward, there are going to be a number of questions we just don't have answers to. There are going to be a number of emotional struggles we feel, we may feel that the winds and the waves of emotion or emotional turmoil are beating against us so hard we think we're going to drown. And in the midst of having all our questions without answers, I want this to be the truth that you can set yourself in and know this is certain and this is solid and this is true. In the midst of being tossed about, I want this truth to be the anchor that just ties us down and holds us steady. No matter the emotional turmoil that comes. Glenn Perry loved this truth. He told me in the back of the sanctuary, this is what people need to hear. And so this is what I want to spell out to you tonight. I just want to do it in three quick statements. The first one is this. The reason no one can be justified by our good works is because God demands perfect righteousness. The reason no one can be justified by our good works is because God demands perfect righteousness. What this means is, if you're going to spend eternity with the Lord in His kingdom, God demands not pretty good, that won't cut it. Not very good, that won't cut it. He demands absolutely perfect righteousness. And because Glenn Perry wasn't perfect, and because you're not perfect, and because I'm not perfect, this has massive implications for us, doesn't it? It means if we're relying on our goodness as being good enough, then we are hopeless. Later in the book of Galatians, Paul says, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the law and do them. What this truth means is that if you give your life to loving other people, doing them good, trying to obey everything you think is right, exhaust your life in doing good deeds, and die while lying on your deathbed, surrounded by people quoting the Bible and singing Amazing Grace, and you're trusting in that as your hope for righteousness. 
it is not enough. Because God demands perfect righteousness. But there's good news. Statement two. The reason we can be justified by faith in Christ is because Jesus did live a perfectly righteous life and paid for the sins of everyone who will trust in him. You see, this text does not only tell us what is not sufficient, your good works, my good works. It tells us what is. Paul says repeatedly that we are justified through faith in Christ Jesus. There is only one who ever perfectly obeyed God. But let me say that positively. There is one who perfectly obeyed God, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. God sent his son who took on flesh. Jesus lived among us and he lived a perfect life, obeying God perfectly at every point. And then he went to the cross, bearing our sins and paying our penalty, being raised on the third day. And here's the good news. If you refuse to rely on your good works as any basis for your righteousness before God, any reason to be approved of by God, and you turn and by faith place your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ who lived and who died and who was raised, then God will take his perfect righteousness and credit it to you. He will also take your sin and count it as being paid for and removed through Jesus' death on the cross. He lets Jesus' perfect life count for us and lets his death count for our penalty being paid. So that if your faith is in Jesus Christ, on that final day, you will stand before God, not perfectly good, but clothed with the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And there's a third truth. For those of us who trust by faith in Christ alone for salvation, Jesus is our complete and only hope of righteousness before God. He's our complete and only hope of righteousness before God. If we stand before God on the final day, trusting 99% in Christ's righteousness and 1% in our own, we will be condemned. If you refuse to place your faith in Jesus Christ, then you're going to stand in your own righteousness and that's not enough. But if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you will stand in his righteousness and it is enough. In fact, it alone is enough. What this means for me and you is this. If on the final day of our lives here on earth, the final day, that night we're going to meet our maker. If on that day we're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and yet on that day, we fall short in so many ways. We sin against others. We show extraordinary selfishness. We hurt those we love. We miss opportunities to serve and encourage. And we get to the end of the day to meet our maker. Our only plea before God will be what Jesus Christ has done for us. And that will be enough. Now you might ask, but, but, but what if on my final day I sin in such a way that I'm selfish and self-centered? What if I sin in such a way that I hurt deeply those I love? My question is, is there any other kind of sin except one that's selfish and self-centered? That's utterly irrational that hurts deeply those whom we love. There is no other sin. We will die as sinners. That's why our hope is in Christ, in His righteousness. It also means for those of us who are trusting in Jesus Christ, if on our final day in this world, we do much good, we build up others with our words, we exercise extraordinary self-sacrificing kindness, we care for those we love, we seemingly take every opportunity to serve and encourage and we get to the end of the day and go to be with our maker, our only plea will be what Jesus Christ has done. And that alone will be sufficient. We'll not be able to stand before God and speak of this, all the sin we've avoided or all the good we have done. We will merely speak of what Christ has done for us and that has been credited to us. That's the message that Glenn told me in the back of the sanctuary he loved. That's the message he struggled like you and me to believe because it sounds so good. It seems too good to be true. And yet it's true. 
It's the message he said we needed to hear. We need it so deeply because apart from Christ's perfect life and sin-bearing death and resurrection, none of us has hope. But if our faith is in his perfect life and sin-bearing death and resurrection, then our hope is certain. This is the message that comforts us. We don't know why. Mr. Glenn would take his own life. But we do know, don't we? Every one of us in this room knows, don't we? What it's like to be deceived by sin. Every one of us in this room knows what it's like to be blinded to what is good and right. Every one of us in this room knows what it's like to know despair. And every one of us in this room knows what it's like for the enemy to entice us in such a way that what should appear as irrational and hurtful seems to us okay. Every one of us in this room knows that, don't we? Every one of us in this room has walked that road. Every one of us in this room has been blinded to the point that we've sinned many times over. And so what do we say then when the enemy points that out? What do we say when the enemy points that out to us? What do we say when the enemy who likes to entice us to sin and then when we sin accuses us of being sinful and guilty and worthy of death and hell? What do we say to him then? What do we say if he were to whisper those accusations to us about our brother Glenn, whose faith is in Jesus Christ, we answer him, I think, the same way that Martin Luther advised us to when he said, when the devil throws up our sins to us and declares that we deserve death and hell, we ought to speak thus, I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? Does this mean that I shall be sentenced to eternal damnation? By no means. For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction in my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That truth was Mr. Glenn's hope. That truth should be your hope. And that truth is my hope. That truth is the hope of anyone who places our faith in Jesus Christ and declares not in a way that, 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 that feels weak and is admitting defeat, all I have is Christ, but it's the hope of everyone who triumphantly proclaims, all I have is Christ. On the day that Mr. Glenn went to be with the Lord, his plea was, all I have is Christ. And that is enough. What this truth means is that the believer who dies singing Amazing Grace with his family at his bedside and the believer who dies by taking his own life will stand before God saying, all I have is Christ and what he did for me and that is enough. In fact, that's the only thing that is enough. Our good works will not suffice before his demand for perfect righteousness and our sins are not enough to triumph over his sin-bearing death and resurrection. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. All we have is Christ, and that is enough. That's the message Mr. Glenn told me that day in the back of the sanctuary we all need to hear. And I say to that this evening, amen. Yesterday, after I'd already reflected on the means of that the Lord had used through Mr. Glenn to show me so much encouragement and comfort and, and hope in my life, and specifically in this church, I received an email from Preston Atkinson, brother, former member of the church who knew Mr. Glenn and loved Mr. Glenn deeply. And I want to conclude with what Preston wrote. Here's what he wrote. Life is filled with unsung heroes, helpers that God uses to push us back in the race. I honor and celebrate one such man who had confidence in God to encourage me and fan into flame the spiritual gifts within. I had just soon not go back into ministry until Glenn Perry asked me to prepare and teach his Sunday school class at Cornerstone Community Church in 2000. What a risk he took to love a sinner like me and tell me who God is. 
Little did I know that teaching his class would become a weekly privilege and renewed desire for ministry. Cornerstone's connected my family with many who are serving Christ and gospel ministry throughout the world. But Glenn Perry and his wife Barbara Perry are the steadfast local innkeepers who encouraged, prayed, and blessed those who came through the boarding school of sanctification and future service. There are many ways I remember this dear brother, hospitality not being the least of his great services to many. I spent more time in his house than any other. His kindness made it safe to take my shoes off in his presence. Giving of his time and resources steadied the cornerstone vessel in lean years. I dare say practically there would be no cornerstone today apart from the grace through the Christian life of Glenn Perry. And never wanting attention drawn to himself, never demanding a hearing, always striving for peace. His silence was wisdom. His patience with others, maturity. His prayers, a sweet aroma. His humility led in hard times and his rock-solid support of the pastors. His rock-solid support of the pastors, especially Pastor Lee Tankersley, gives an example for all to follow. He was the watchman on the wall as Cornerstone was born and grew to stability. I honor my friend and brother in Christ with tears. In a day when people so easily sacrifice relationships for the sake of comfort and convenience, Glenn Perry did not abandon ship. There are rewards for men like Brother Glenn. Whatever despair he knew is in no way greater than the grip of the Savior's love for him. Jesus assures us that he does not lose a single one of his sheep. For I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And to that I add, Amen. Now when your hope is in Jesus Christ, and you know you're a sinner, but you know Christ's righteousness is enough, you can stand as one who knows your sin very well and boldly proclaim, I am bound for the promised land. And so I'm going to invite the musicians to come forward. And as they come forward, I want to ask you to stand. And let us sing together, On Jordan's stormy banks I stand, a song in which we'll say over and over again, I am bound for the promised land. Let's sing together. Yeah.
and we're reminded about that in this part of time. But we know that what you say to us is true. It's even true in the days when we find it hard to believe. And we know that those who you have predestined, you've called, and those you have called, you have justified, and those you have justified, you will indeed glorify. This is the truth. And we know you justify come appearing by the blood of Jesus Christ. <coughs> And we know these words that were just read are true. They are our comfort. As a matter of fact, if you came back right now, we would watch them rise and meet you in the air while we were alive. Wait. And this is a comfort about us, for us, about Him. It's a comfort to us. For we all have looked at the mirror and saw the wicked sinner, saved by grace. We all have said it's not right that that should have taken place, but we are so grateful. We all have struggled with our own sins. And we're grateful we can cry out for forgiveness. But we do ask you to comfort our hearts. We hurt. We cry out that you will send your Holy Spirit, who you have called the Comforter, that you will work in us as individuals and as a body. Because there's going to be a lot of little places we don't see it. Including sweating outside by the barbecue grill during church picnics. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to spend some time with Clint. That was your kindness to us. Thank you that we knew him for who he was. But we pray. Um, that you will comfort the family and his church family and that his testimony now the fact that he lived his life for Jesus even with his flaws would you use this time now that there's somebody here who doesn't know him know you would you touch their hearts right now for he's living with you but those who don't have a relationship with you by faith are going to die and go to hell. And you wouldn't wish that for anyone. And those who don't know you suffer in the middle of their wickedness with no hope. And he would not want that. We are grateful for the chance to celebrate his life to hug one another, to mourn together. You go as it's okay. But may this not just be mourning. Help us to rejoice the fact that the sufferings of this world aren't compared to the glory that you have to come. Thank you for loving us so much. In Jesus' name. The family would like to invite all of you uh, to come to a dinner at the Perry home uh, immediately following the service and also uh, in lieu of flowers. The family has also requested that you would make uh, donations if you desire uh, in memory of Glenn Perry to the Care Center of Jackson. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.